just got some questions. I don't, I'm going to feed back to you some of the things that I've seen because I want to, you know, I've heard a lot of things and I need to get a little more feedback. Um, other people, though, have real presentations. So you can see Roar, Squeak, Nos, however you say that, Native Boost, and Hazel. And so we'll do those after lunch. Sorry? Do you have a presentation? Okay, well, you can put yourself down on this piece of paper. It is, it is, or else I'm just going to get confused. So, my first question is Is a literal a symbol? Like, these are literals. And. Is a literal symbol, and if it's not a symbol, what is it? An association? So a literal is a subset of possibility. You can't just put a big class. It's only of a few. Yeah. And so literal is defined as everything that you can write down in text, and it's an object. It's directly one string, uh, all these things. Right. Literal array or something. Great. That's enough for that. The VM does not enforce that. So you can put into the literal array anything. And the literal. This is a strict used in a wrapper method. Yeah. Uh, these literals, there is the special. I'll get to that in a second. And, and you can actually write a really cool uh, method to uh, annoy people that actually counts its own invocation. Yeah. See, now you've gone off. You've gone off the reservation. I just want to get the yeah. standard answer. Um, how do I see an oop? Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm kind of in my head confusing a, a header with an object-oriented pointer. So if I had, you know, can I, when I say how do I see, I mean always what can I put in a workspace? Like is a, an oop something you can see in a workspace or it's just, it's just in a virtual machine? Okay, next question. Um, we'll get to the last thing. I'm going to finish with a question about Lisp versus Smalltalk, and that will totally go off the rails, of course. Um, Object, you see, I saw a lot of, uh, I listed a lot of things that I saw, like, um, you know, object memory, header type. I guess the things that are taking place in the virtual machine you can't see in a workspace, right? That's not, you know, if I said, no, whatever. Special objects array, I think I did see, um, yeah, so I did see uh, Elliot do that. Um, how do I see the special objects array? That's it? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then just inspect that. Okay. And otherwise, you have the recreate the special objects array method that you have on the disk. So the, the special objects array is going to have a certain set of things like true, false, that are always going to be the same. And I guess. Um, Stranger things get added to it, like these symbols, these selectors. Okay. And that's the interface, the basic interface between the virtual machine and the. See, that's where the uh, virtual machine is going to pull things to find. Okay, cool. So then I have a question. Why is the car from uh, some elements are associated with this? Mean that the, the it's historical because we have some evolved, yes. Hmm? Because we have some machine evolved and there are some things which are obsolete. So you can see drop and up. Um 
I understand there is a thing called the object graph, and the um, garbage collector walks the object graph to look for, you know, associations, not associations, references that don't exist anymore. Craig Latta, uh, I believe this is an object graph visually depicted. Craig Latta's blog, he uh, gets information from the simulator, and so this is an object graph. But um, I guess, I guess again, you can't see that in the the workspace. That's something that the I mean the explorer is perfect. The explorer. So I, I mean, I just I just did. That's an object graph. No, except that uh, that is. Uh, there are no faces. Yes, but uh, you, you don't see them any in the list. If you have looked, you see the list is closed. Oh, yes, right. So, so yeah. I'm seeing a subset object graph. Not the whole object graph, so I'd be seeing, you know, a portion of what's going on for a certain class. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and, and there are tools to find um, back pointers. So there is there is a, a tool to, to pointer finder. scan a pointer finder to scan and a point and the explorer even to to scan everything to find Give who points to you. Of objects is pointing to you. Give me the list of objects that are pointing to me. So they have refer existing references to me right now. Yeah. And then, of course, has to scan the whole memory because there are no back pointers in the model. Okay. Um, back to trailer of the compiled method. Um, basically, what is it doing and why is it there? Now, I understand it's a, you know, here, this is confusing to me. It's a reference to something, and sometimes it can be zero. So it, this so is take the class name compiled method trailer. Okay. One below. One below. Oh, it's its own class. Yeah. All right, and, and take the okay. Right. Good. Good. Um. Well, I'll refer, yeah. Well, see, this is it. Like, it's not, uh, I'm not trying to ask big, complicated questions. But, I mean, this is kind of amazing to me after I've spent this week learning so much that, you know, time now, that was a, you know, Elliot went on for hours about what that just did. It's just, uh, I'm kind of coming to the conclusion before I ask my Lisp question. You get code, you compile it, you get a compiled method. The compiled method is in inside a method context. Um, I'm not really sure how you go from the method context and feed that to interpret, interpret or interpret, right? That's the bandsaw that method contexts go in. That's the infinite loop that collects all the. How does the how does the method context send stuff to interpret or interpret? It does. It's and it's going. Context, you see which is which method is uh, is currently used, and all the state like what is the current instruction pointer, and of course you can find what is next because you just increment the instruction and fetch it the bytecode from the compiled method. It's just going to eat whatever comes next. Okay, yeah. and by so. The, by the way, you can have multiple method context for a single method. You have multiple method, method context for a single. Okay. Um, right, so that gets, in, we'll go into the interpreter. How is the answer being returned back to the image? So, so you have special uh, bytecode, uh, return, which is you can see the, yeah, return top. Return top. Yeah, so what it does is just uh, for, for currently active context, it takes the sender, which is a, Yeah, so okay. It exactly, it does what it always does. It just chews up more byte codes and one of them says return. Okay, I, I get it. Um, so we've created an object and an object is garbage collected. Actually, I don't really want to go into garbage collection. We've got that um, 
the object graph, it, it collects, it, it goes over the, it looks for ones that don't have references and then destroys them. Okay, I'm getting a better sense of the uh, cycle, you know, in and out. That may be, that's the bulk of what I was looking for. Interpret, interpret, activate new method. See, once things go into the interpreter, it's kind of going to explode and I guess activate new method and interpret next instruction for and this kind of thing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really awesome. I'm really thrilled to have taken this week to find just that loop because just looking at the um, looking at all those methods in interpreter and object memory there was just no vector in so it's really great that I've got that um, so I'm gonna keep going for about I don't know nine minutes or something but my question is more open-ended now about the difference between Lisp and small talk. The fellow who we had here um, the other day, okay, my, my basic visual comparison is going to be is that Lisp is a pancake, work with me, and that um, small talk is a layer cake. It seems to me that the fellow who came by the other day and he showed, uh, you know, he had, everybody in Lisp seems to want to build their own implementation. They, seem, they all seem to do it. And it seems to be very, very shallow between the metal and the C and the Lisp. And they're always very keen on how fast it is. And Elliot was saying something interesting that the whole question of how small talk has contexts, it's a layer, you know, between the metal or the C and whatever is above. So we have more layers than Lisp, it seems to me. Um, and there's a trade off for that. And I'm kind of thinking, I always thought, I guess my, my basic statement is I always thought that Lisp was the best language, but I don't know anything about Lisp. It's just that Lispers are so like in my face about how wonderful Lisp is that I thought, okay, well, you must be the best language. But the whole business, Elliot was talking about lexical scoping and how we have the complication of dealing with scoping over contexts. And that that's not something we do just to make our life miserable in small talk. It's something we make a trade-off for. And so I'm kind of trying to understand, you know, is Lisp a less reflective language than Smalltalk? Are we more reflective because we have a context layer? Are we more reflective because we have these layers? Or that's my dump of question. And so is, you know, is Lisp a pancake and Smalltalk a layer cake? And is, is Lisp more reflective? Is it a better language? Did I waste my week? I'll have to firm right now. So we, yeah. You only have all these parentheses everywhere, and you cannot read the code as, as easy as you do it in small. So we make a trade-off for usability. Yeah, one thing that was really interesting too is that uh, you say, do you want to program in Lisp or do you want to program in Smalltalk? But the the Belgian professor was here was programming in C. He was complaining quite vociferously about how he spent all his time debugging things in C. And I compare that to Elliot Miranda, who, is, who has, I guess, recently discovered the simulator. And he said that the script that he used to get metrics about COG was written in a simulator. It took an hour. To have done it in C or some other way would have taken a week. He said, quote, it was the most fun he's ever had programming a virtual machine. Think how crazy that is for him to say something like that. I mean, that's a guy with a lot of experience. And the most fun he's ever had is using the simulator. So. It seems to me that if you're programming in Lisp, that guy's not even programming in Lisp. He's spending all his time in C. And why would you do that? He doesn't even like C. And, and Elliot's like, well, I've abstracted above. I'm using the simulator. He's just happy as can be. So it's just a strange, a strange contrast. Sure.
So if you build that into Lisp, you've got as much as you want. Ah. So you're better at modeling a domain like a factory floor. You kind of conceptually it's easier in small talk than in Lisp. Same about C. It's harder to model things. That makes total sense to me. Modeling issue, yeah. That makes sense to me because the guys I've met who I've met a lot of people who use Lisp, they all seem to like math, like a lot. And they have the kind of mathematical purity. And I'm talking to the wrong crowd to be an anti math guy, but. Sorry? Yeah, it's just they seem to have a kind of like, this is intellectually pure, <laughs> the lisp. And guys in math have this, this is intellectually pure, and I don't care about math all that much. I don't think people who program computers even use it very much. I, although people who, be, who, and who become programmers all seem to be kick ass at math. I don't care about it. But the lispers, um, they, that seems to kind of jibe with that intellectual purity. Um, that's basically the run of my. Uh, you've answered all my. I'm gonna have to think about all the things you've said, but in a quick uh, rundown. Is there anything else? You know, I think we're. Oh, we're right on time. We can leave. Like, okay, I guess that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for your time.